Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so next up, we have a uh, sponsor's talk by uh, Kenji Takeda, who, who is the uh, director of the Microsoft Azure for Research program. He's also a visiting fellow of the Allen Scoring Institute and also a senior fellow and also uh, a visiting senior lecturer at uh, Southampton University. Um, so he'll be talking today about uh, the uses of IoT and open data, uh, and then towards the end of his talk, he'll be talking about uh, some of the tools that might be of use to people in the room who are taking part in the hack day. So, uh, I'm going to you. So there are seven and a half billion people on the planet today, and over 80% of those live in less developed countries. And over 2 billion of those people live on less than about three and a half dollars a day. And we have an opportunity because we are the first generation who is able to end poverty for those seven and a half billion people on the planet. But we're also the last generation that can end climate change. And with this in mind, 193 countries signed up to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And these 17 goals aim to leave no one behind. From ending poverty and ending hunger to gender equality and also economic prosperity. And to do this, we need to monitor and track our progress. And that's very difficult, because for every one of these SDGs, we have to know the percentage of the population, for instance, that's in poverty or lacks education. And we need to do that at a country level within each country at a sub-regional level as well. And so you can summarize that challenge very simply, which is how do we count every person on earth? And it sounds simple, but it's actually very difficult. If you think about how we do that today, the national census is a gold standard. In the UK, this happens about every decade. And the Office for National Statistics is working very hard preparing for the next one. On average, a national census is done between every six or ten years. But in some countries, for instance in Afghanistan, the last national census was done in 1979. So our ability to help people in these countries can be severely limited. And when we look at the Sustainable Development Goals that we need to achieve by 2030, there may only be one census data point between now and then. And so we need to figure out how to do better at counting people. And there are different ways of doing that. People use household surveys so rather than entire national census surveys um, at a more local level. But there are other data sets available. So for instance, with ESA, the Sentinel, Sentinel satellite system, right, sensing system makes its data openly available so that people can use it in different ways. And what we can do is we can take these different layers of data. We can take data such as the household surveys and census data and also the satellite data, even suitably anonymized call data records from mobile phone companies. And we can try and merge these layers and use statistics and machine learning to estimate populations around the world. And a world-leading project is led by my friend Professor Antti Tatum at the University of Southampton is doing this. And they really are world leaders in this. And what they can do is they can estimate down to the kilometer level where people are and who they are in their demographics. And once you can do that, and once you take that data and you publish that data as open data as the World Pop team do, then you can do things like measure poverty levels. 
and you can estimate the levels, levels of poverty by looking at different factors. So, for instance, the distance people live to a, a major road, whether they're in a city, whether they're mobile, whether they have mobile phones. And we can use those factors in order to create estimates of population. And you can create maps like this that show the percentage of the population, for instance, earning less than $2 a day across an entire country at a very, very high resolution. And because that data could be satellite data, we can do that on a much finer time scale than just the national census. For hunger, for instance, we can look at the stunted growth of girls, so a proxy for whether they're malnutrition, malnutritious or not. Again, at a one kilometer grid resolution using these advanced data science techniques. We can look at healthcare, for instance, where in these countries in Africa, women receive postnatal care within, critically within 48 hours of childbirth. And helping with vaccination programs, so the, the vaccination program here is able to target the villages in a very precise way, because it's critical not just where, but when you vaccinate to try and eradicate a disease such as polio. And looking at things like education, so here, for instance, the percentage of women who are literate. Again, at that very fine spatial scale, but also at a temporal scale, which is much higher than is otherwise possible. So why am I talking about this? Because the World Pop team used the HPC system at Southampton uh, called Iridis, uh, which is a fantastic machine. But sometimes they need the data in a hurry. They do work, for instance, with the World Bank. They do work with the United Nations. Whenever a disaster strikes, the, United, the World Pop team supply the population maps to the United Nations Emergency Response Team so they know where to send aid and where to send first responders. And when that happens, they need the answer straight away. They can't sit in a queue on a university HPC machine. And so they can use the cloud, and they've basically taken their whole processing pipeline in R, and they've been able to move that into the cloud so they can do that on-demand processing whenever they need it. And another project that I want to talk about is around clean water and sanitation. And one of the things with water is you can, if you don't have access to clean water and sanitation, you can get into a vicious spiral of poverty. Because if you don't have clean water, you can get sick. And if you're sick, you can't go to school, your education suffers, and you can't work. And if you're unable to work, you can't earn money. And if you can't earn money, then there are not enough taxes for the government to be able to pay for good water and sanitation. And so we get into this vicious spiral. So a team of researchers at the University of Oxford, primarily funded by DFID, have this multi-year project called REACH, who are looking at water poverty in a very holistic way. And what they do is they look at it in terms of the poverty reduction they can achieve by reducing the water security. And they look at it not just from a sort of geographical and geological perspective, but also from an economic perspective and also from a, a social perspective as well. And it's really interesting because most projects only look at one of those things. But if you really want to crack the problem and you really need to convince the decision makers you have to give them the right information at the right time to help them in the short term, but also in the long term. And what that looks like is this. So this is one of the villages in Kwale County in Kenya. And you can see how different it is to the privileged life we live here. And you can see how they have to truck in water. Well, here you can see one of the hand water pumps where the children are playing, but also where the children uh, and the adults can get water. And so this infrastructure for water is critical, and the government has to, to provide that. And what the team have been doing is they've taken essentially accelerometers from, similar to what we have in our wearables, say in our Fitbits, and they've taken those accelerometers, attached batteries to them. They've actually put mobile phone transceivers in there as well, so it can take data and record the data from the accelerometer, send it by SMS message and up into the cloud in order for them to measure what's happening on each water pump. 
What's interesting is just by putting a pretty simple IoT device on these hand water pumps, they've created this new accidental infrastructure, they call it, in Africa, where they can actually measure what's happening at these pumps. And so um, the team here um, from Oxford can tell you about it much better than I can. I grew up in rural parts of Kenya, which um, have quite high rates of, of poverty. In our family, we used to get on our bicycles, each of us carrying three jerry cans. So it would be like three or four people, me, my uncles, and my cousins. We would travel like 20 kilometers on a bicycle for that day to go look for water. Over four out of five people in the world that don't have access to safe drinking water live in rural areas. This situation is particularly compounded in Africa, where hand pumps and rural water supplies often fail. And one of the newest technologies that's now emerged in terms of mobile solutions and cloud-based computing is allowing us to advance with innovative ways to address this problem. The REACH program is aiming to make 5 million poor people water secure in Africa and Asia. Groundwater is one of the safest supplies of water in rural regions of Kenya. So being able to track the depth of the aquifer is critically important in being able to understand how healthy that water system is. We may be familiar with the idea of using one's smartphone or smart devices to carry around with us and to use to monitor our own health. Um, the idea here was, well, can't we put some of those mobile health devices into the handle of a pump? So the data is really interesting. Um, when you see a raw accelerometry pot, you kind of get, you get these curves of the actual motion of someone pumping. When the pump is deeper, the, the weight of the water that you're lifting is much larger, and so there'll be more vibrations Whereas when the pump is shallower, you're lifting less water, and so there will be smaller vibrations. Imagine you have multiple intelligent nodes. They're all transmitting data. You have to integrate data in a cloud-based system from data nodes across an entire region, tens of thousands of pumps in our case. That needs to be done in a cloud-based situation where one has a huge amount of computing resource to be able to perform the heavyweight machine learning algorithms on the integrated data. We like the inclusion of the Azure Machine Learning Framework, which allowed us to port our existing R and Python-based machine learning tools directly into a safe cloud-based system. Azure ML makes fitting machine learning models much faster, as I can explore the parameter space much quicker on the cloud than just on my own computer. <laughs> I think making data usable and effective decision makers is absolutely critical. Policy makers and decision makers have the responsibility to take very difficult and onerous decisions and there's, there's a huge information deficit in terms of how they should proceed. So the ability to collect data at scale in a way that's usable and appropriate for them is extremely powerful. Initially it used to take more than 30 days to repair a hand pump. But now because we have this information, when a hand pump breaks down, we can repair them within less than three days or sometimes even 48 hours. So that has enabled the villages to have better access to water. My hope and aspirations is to see this system making my village and other villages back in Kenya water secure and moving them out of poverty. So that project shows how, by taking a pretty simple IoT device, but being able to deploy hundreds or thousands of those, can provide some extra insight. And here's an example of some of the data they're getting off one of those pumps. And it's pretty interesting, because in the green here, we can see the pump usage. Um, and in the uh, blue at the top, you can sort of see the, the rainfall. Um, and by being able to look at this data, they can sort of try and posit different uh, behaviors within the community. And what happens is when it rains, after a heavy rainfall, they actually use the wells less. Okay, but the wells is really the only safe source of water. And so what they think is the villagers are going out and not having to travel quite as far to the well and collecting water from places which actually might be a dirty supply of water. So they have to figure out now they've got some of this information is how can they um, influence uh, the villagers to still use the water well 
even when there may be these easier sources of water that may actually affect their health. And looking at the economics of this as well, the team have been helping to set up this startup called Fundifix, where the villagers pay the startup a small amount of money every month, so the startup's able to monitor the pumps, and it also pays for them to go and fix the pumps as well. So again, this socioeconomic part, it's not just the technical piece, the technical piece is obviously important and enabling, but they're now trying to figure out how to do this at scale, working with the local government uh, and the national government so that they can extend this across uh, across the whole of Kenya. But what's interesting is once you have these sensors and you can measure the depth of a single water well, once you deploy those on hundreds or thousands, you actually get a pretty much real-time monitoring system for the groundwater depth, which is probably better than what we have in the UK, just by putting an IoT device on those manual water pumps. So it's very interesting going from that very simple idea of putting a single device on a single well to be able to go to this national level sort of planning tool. And what they can do is take that data from the wells and then turn that, oops, <laughs> turn that into some modeling. And this model is, is, is actually, if you can see, it says water security versus wealth. So this is actually a socioeconomic model. Okay, so they can look at how can we move the country out of poverty by securing the water supply? <coughs> how much is it going to cost? And how can we do that? And what that means is effectively we can have better decision making by the policy makers who can actually, you know, cause change, positive change in the country. The last little case study I want to talk about is going into more agriculture and some of the work we're actually doing in Microsoft Research itself. Um, looking at how we can use IoT devices and some of the unique uh, technologies we've de been developing in the lab um, to connect those devices um, on, on some farms, um, in this case in the US. This area is known as Stewart's Landing and this is Dancing Crow Farm. One of the world's problems is yield. How do you double the yield by 2050 to feed the growth of the population in the world? This is a project that we recently started. What we want to do is we want to enable data-driven farming. The first goal is to give a real-time view of the farm, real-time parts of the farm to the farmer saying, hey, this is what your farm is doing right now. So how do you even connect these farms? To, to the internet. It's so far remote, the cell carriers have very little incentive to provide connectivity in the farms. The system that we have deployed here is measuring the soil temperature and moisture, and it's coming from this sensor. Here what you see is a white spaces device. The idea that we had was a farmer buys a, a white space router, plug it in the farm, and your entire farm is connected. Now you can connect multiple devices, and connectivity is cheap. So you can actually deploy many more sensors in the farm. You can have a dense deployment of sensors getting real-time view of all the parts of the farm. Not only your soil and moisture data, but this is a high bandwidth connection. You can connect cameras, get real-time views from the farm. Once you have all this data, you could then analyze the data to predict what the future will look like. I'm actually really looking forward to how the process will change. This last year has been mainly a data gathering, information collecting year for the Microsoft research team. I'm really looking forward to seeing what research they've gathered this year, putting that together with what I think is going to happen next year, and make predictions for what I should plant when and where. So what's interesting there, they talk about this white space technology. So. What we've been developing um, is wireless technology that uses the frequency band that teletext used to use on TVs. Okay, if those of you remember teletext. Um, so it's called TV white space. Uh, we've done some deployments. We've done one in Seattle. We've actually done one across Cambridge. And what it does is it gives you high bandwidth. It gives you 10, 100 megabit per second over five kilometer range with a standard Wi-Fi protocol. So that's what we've deployed here in the farm where having that connectivity is, is otherwise quite difficult. And again, with normal IoT devices, like in Kenya, you can have a very low bandwidth because you're only sending a few bits of information. 
But here on the farm, they're able to actually do video streaming because this TV white space technology gives them that high bandwidth but long range um, connection. And so I hope I've been able to show you how different researchers um, around the world, um, in Southampton or, and uh, in Oxford and at our own uh, lab in, in Redmond, uh, has been working on a few different facets. The open data with WorldPop, um, and they actually have recently published in the scientific data, um, the data article that describes their data sets and how to access those data sets. And also a couple of examples of IoT, similar to, to the devices that you've got, um, and what people can do with those things. So I want to just finish off with a few things to hopefully help with the hack day, um, and a few of the things that a lot of researchers are finding really, really useful. Um, how many of you use Jupyter Notebooks? Okay, how many of you host your own servers to run them? Okay. So you don't have to. Uh, you can upload them to our cloud Jupyter Notebooks service called Agile Notebooks. Uh, it's a completely free service where you can upload a notebook, click on the notebook, and it spins up a container with an executable notebook. They're limited, but they, each notebook has about four gigabytes of RAM. Um, you can share the libraries publicly. Lots of people are using this. So Cambridge University, their entire first year engineering undergraduate cohort of 350 students is using this for their Python course. Uh, and also at UCL and Oxford, um, they're also using this. So it's very good for teaching. Could be quite interesting in different carpentry courses, for instance, where you don't have to worry about the infrastructure. What they do at Cambridge is they post the content on GitHub. They have a link across to here. So the stu each student clicks the link, and when they they click the link, it clones all the notebooks into that student's account, uh, and it fires up their own executable notebooks. Um, so it's really good for teaching. It's also really, really good for open science. And so the Gravitational Waves team, the LIGO Consortium, are using Azure Notebooks for their reproducible research. So they put their data up in the cloud, and their notebooks over here are the notebooks for one of their discoveries with the data, and it's their full analysis um, of that, uh, that data set. And so it's a really <coughs> interesting way of sharing your methods. So you often do that on GitHub, but how does somebody actually run that? It's a real classic problem around reproducible research, is where do you run the reproducible code? And with this, if it's in a Jupyter Notebook and we currently support Python and R and F-sharp, then you can create these libraries of notebooks and share them, share that URL around the world. Um, and you know, we provide it as a free hosted execution service, but then you can also version control them obviously in GitHub or GitLab or wherever you like. So when we tell people about this, they kind of go a bit crazy. <laughs> this, it's so easy, you literally go upload, file, and then click clone and, and you're up and running. So it's, uh, um, and it's got a few libraries pre-installed. So it's got things like uh, NumPy and SciPy and those libraries. And in a, in a Jupyter notebook, you can just do pip install and you can install packages into those notebooks as well. So very, very flexible. The team are very responsive actually for Garth Wells in Cambridge. We implemented IPython widgets in here as well because he needed that. Uh, and so the team, the whole actual roadmap is on. Uh, on GitHub as well, so you can see what our roadmap is, and you can suggest changes and do pull requests so that we can fix them. So, so that's something for the hacker hack day. Uh, again, this could be pretty useful. Um, so I thought I'd show you that one. Um, the other thing we have is um, something we call Microsoft Academic. Um, so what we've done is we've taken the academic literature, so academic papers, and we now crawl those as we crawl any other web content. Okay, so unlike other providers where they run this in a completely separate search infrastructure, we've actually embedded this into the Bing search engine now. So academic papers are now a first class citizen in Bing. Uh, and so we read them and we can do uh, semantic search and recommend them, recommend the systems. What we've also done is we've taken that data set, we've zipped it up, it's about 300 gigs, and we've posted it. So you can download the entire scholarly record since Proxoc A, which was David when was <laughs> Proxoc A, a century or two ago. Um, you can actually download the, the raw data set if you want. Um, but it's pretty big to work with. So we also provide an API, so you can call into that data set and you can do interesting things around the scholarly record. And Tom yesterday, actually, afterwards, he told me that what they did is they did an innovation dashboard where they had startups and they could see who the founders of the startups were. 
And then they use the API to then go and find all their publications and co-authors and build the provenance of that startup from the original university research using this academic uh, knowledge API. And then we also have a web, web interface as well, Microsoft Academic, that you can go to uh, and you can search and, and um, uh, use that uh, to look at the different publications. Um, and we've been working really hard on this academic graph. So it's now at a point where we have this data set. So we have over 160 million publications. So essentially all publications, all authors. We run competitions around author disambiguation, for instance, uh, which is a tricky problem. Um, we also have events. So we would have, for instance, a conference like CVPR, and then every instance of that conference okay, in there as well. So you can track, for instance, people through a different through a conference series um, and also obviously their institutions as well. So, so this graph, again, is available for all download, but the Academic Knowledge API um, is very, very usable. Um, and there's different ways you can uh, query that. I mean, it's just a REST API. Um, so again, I thought that could be pretty interesting listening to all the lightning talks. Uh, if you want to link anything to papers, uh, then this um, provides you uh, an API to do that. So I'd uh, be really uh, excited to see if anybody uh, you know, can use this for, for the hackathon um, and see if that can really help out. And then um, this is what's in the box. If any of you have unpacked them, you may not have unpacked them and laid them out quite as nicely as this. Um, I certainly haven't. Um, uh, there's a little, it's actually not an Arduino, it's actually an Arduino compatible device. Um, it's actually got more memory than an Arduino, it's faster than an Arduino. Um, and a bunch of bits, basically. So, um, so hopefully, um, some of you will be able to get this kit working. We'll run the workshop a bit later on this afternoon. I'll talk you through how to get that set up. And um, it's all on, on GitHub, the instructions. Um, and then hopefully you can have some fun with that. And if you don't do it for the hack day, hopefully you can have some, some fun at home. We have a number of these we call them Azure IoT kits. One of the key things is they've got built-in Wi-Fi, um, you know, which is usually a challenge with an IoT kit. We do a sort of Raspberry Pi one as well um, and sort of different ones. But this is, this is a pretty basic one that can do a reasonable number of things. So, um, so hopefully we'll have a bit of fun with that. Um, and like I say, be interested to see what, what people can do with that. And actually with the, with the Azure piece, the cloud piece, what you can do is you can basically single click deploy a cloud infrastructure to ingest the data, manage all the data, secure it. So this uses X509 certificates for end-to-end -end encryption, for instance. And then um, you can then start storing the data and processing the data and do streaming analytics. You can set alarms and triggers on the, the data as well as it comes through. So we'll go through that a bit later on this afternoon for those of you who come to the, the IoT workshop. And then um, I know some of you have already got these um, Azure for Research Awards. So this is the program that I run where we try and um, provide um, some Azure credits to researchers so they can play around and explore the cloud and see what they can do with it. So you saw there um, the folks at Oxford who were able to essentially take the work they were doing in the lab just on their laptops with Python, and they could hoist it up into the cloud so they could deploy. Uh, and also the WorldPop team were able to take their R processing pipeline. What's well, the interesting thing with WorldPop actually is they have, Iridis has a few thousand cores, it's a pretty, pretty cool machine. But they had a bottleneck in the processing where it was taking the researcher, I think it was three or four weeks to pre-process the data on his PC, uh, just to you know, um, get the data ready to ship onto the cluster. And what he did was he was able to fire up an Azure Linux VM, uh, which had a lot more memory, and he could do that same piece of work in a couple of days because it wasn't swapping to disk because it had enough RAM. So just the ability to spin up a virtual machine with lots more RAM than he had cut a four-week task into a two-day task. So it's really interesting, some very simple things you can do with the cloud. So you've all been given um, a voucher, basically, which is a month of Azure to play around with. Um, but this award program will give you a few thousand dollars of, of Azure for your project. So if you're interested, uh, talk to me, email me. I'm around today and tomorrow. I'm um, around the hackathon. So. Um, and we actually do these every couple of months. So if you miss 15th of April, 15th of June, 15th of August, um, and we've got about 1,200 of these projects running worldwide. We've probably got about 100 in the UK. Very interested in what people are doing, trying to build a little bit of community around folks. We've been talking to a lot of people here around, um, you know, the excitement around what this can do, but also figuring out how do I use it, um, where do I use this instead of my university IT system, talking to IT teams, 
trying to understand this as well. So we're sort of working together with the research community uh, to try and see where this can really help help with your research. So with that, I'd like to actually thank uh, our friends uh, Andy and Robert and David particularly um, for their help with the slides. Um, and that's our um, Twitter handle and website if you're interested in more about magic research. Thank you. Questions at the Hello. Hi. Do you have the ability to take secure data and then pass it to a spawned notebook? Oh, okay. Um, don't know. In the free one, I don't know. Certainly, you could spin up a Jupyter Hub on a secure VM inside we call Express Route, which extends your data center. Um, it could be an N3 connection or something. So you could do that with a, your own Jupyter Hub instance. With the free instances, um, I'm not sure exactly what the security model is on that one. So. Okay, but you so. normally do it by spawning a, a Jupyter Hub. Yeah, I mean, you could build your own. I mean, we're looking at doing this at the Alan Turing Institute with this project, for instance. So with Azure, what you can do, I mean, a couple, we've deployed UK data centers, and our two customers are the Ministry of Defense um, and the NHS. Um, so it <laughs> gives you an idea of the level of security that we have if, if, if you want to build that out with virtual networking and things. So. So basically anything's possible, um, and we're cleared for the NHS Information Governance Toolkit. So lots of people talk about the cloud not being secure. Um, you'd be surprised what's running in the cloud. So the Metropolitan Police have deployed body cameras, and all that body camera data is going into Azure, for instance, and then can be used in court. The Royal Courts of Justice have actually moved to Azure as well. So um, so yeah, you have to architect it, but yeah, you do have to, to be okay, Sure. The very easy one. The screenshots you showed of uh, Jupiter, um, they were both running Jupiter uh, Python 2. I'm guessing you have Python 3 kernels. Yeah. yeah. I think so, yeah. Have a look on that. Yeah. If anything doesn't work on the Jupyter notebook, just like send it into the email address. They're really responsive. And uh, we're really developing it pretty fast. So if there's a package you want that's not on there that won't install, we can pop it back. It might be an old screenshot. <laughs> so uh, I have a very important question. What's your current favorite application one of the Spark plug kits? What should we be doing with it? Oh, I have no idea. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's some different sensors in there. So there's temperature sensors and humidity sensors and those types of things. Um, I'm not sure. I have a. I was having a great discussion with Chris Gutteridge. I think this is, uh, did you put it in as a hack day idea, your Minecraft idea? So. So actually hooking the virtual world and Minecraft together with the physical world using the IoT kits. Um, so sign up and vote for Chris's hack idea to do that. I'd love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chris, I spoiled it for you. <laughs> that's not one that's too fun, but that's the one you can vote for now. That'll be a team you can vote for. It might be a little bit, um, might be a bit contentious. Um, you know, there's this availability of uh, the academic graph. There's this availability of the infrastructure. Um, maybe not so much the data set of the academic graph, but the the infrastructure. Uh, there's always a worry that, well, I suppose there's a worry with a lot of services you become dependent on them, and they have to be taken away, deciding not to, to do something. Is any I'm not saying that you know that's been open ended, but is there any commitment as to what's going to be done with the infrastructure in terms of that? We are committed to it for the next year, for this, this, this. Is it? Uh, it depends on the service. So um, we do put SLAs and guarantees and things on, on pretty much most of our services. So um, because we have people who do rely on those. So the yeah, Microsoft Academic is used by quite a few commercial customers mm -hmm. um, in the scholarly publishing world, for instance. So. Um, so yeah, we do we do put guarantees around um, pretty much most of all of our commercial services, um, particularly where they're paid for services. Yeah, sure. Because um, obviously with free services, there's a business model behind that. Um, you know, we we um, you know we have 
free and paid services. Um, so yeah, it depends on the service, but we, Microsoft will always work with our enterprise customers. So typically with an enterprise product, in Microsoft will give a 10 year guarantee um, sure. of the availability of that product. So it's not only where well, there's no complaints there, because I'm trying to understand that yeah. if there's a service which is free, then and the majority of things around it, the possibility of paying up for later, mm -hmm. then how much, how much, is there, is there a commitment that you're going to offer it into this one, uh, or everything was okay for the next CJ? I mean, the next one is that everyone went onto the notebooks, mm -hmm. and then from the back there, there's a worry sometimes about depending on infrastructure, which is sure. not free, which you can't move away from. Sure, yeah, I think I think there's a interesting thing to consider, which is no infrastructure is free. Yeah. University infrastructure, university computing infrastructure costs millions of pounds, um, but people don't often see that. If you talk to the IT teams, they mm -hmm. see that, and you talk to the chief financial officer of the university, they see that. So, so nothing is free. So I think you need to consider that. And again, with that, because you know, we're increasingly moving to open source solutions so that you can always move them across to different infrastructure sure. if that did go away. So I think you do, one of the things people don't consider is they sort of think, hey, everything is free, my supercomputer is free at the university. It's not your supercomputer university, it's millions of pounds. Um, somebody has to figure out how to pay for that and how to create a sort of financial model around that. So, um, and it's the same with sort of cloud services, you know, things look free. Um, we had a discussion yesterday around personal data um, and so you kind of need to kind of consider that. So. Okay. Any other questions? This is sort of an oddball question, so I don't know if it's going to have an actual answer. So at my university, we're just moving from uh, Google Drive to OneDrive. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the major complaint is not that one has different um, abilities than the other. Or the other. It's, it's literally the idea of, oh, now I've got to move everything from one place to another. And that okay. seems to be the... Um, the main difficulty that a lot of my colleagues have. And I was just wondering how how complete a life cycle um, can be done. So, I mean, if you are storing your, your data in OneDrive and processing it in Azure and wanting to, you know, have tutorials or demonstrations through notebooks mm -hmm. through Azure and then publish, you know, sort of the final document with mm -hmm. links to all of your data and things like that, yeah. how complete uh, a work cycle do you realistically see as a need. If my colleagues invest in putting all their stuff in this, can they do their entire work to the flow? Sure, yeah. I mean, the notebooks do connect to different data services, um, and to, I think it connects directly to GitHub, but it does connect to OneDrive and things like that. So, so we try and build in those interfaces as much as we can, and I think we're increasingly moving more towards an API world, so, um, so that's becoming kind of increasingly easy. So I think, um, yeah, I think in terms of designing with um, APIs, you might make that a lot easier. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.